Hello, listeners. My name is Dee Dunn. You know my voice from this podcast, of course. What we may not understand or know is that I am actually a member of the Pagan Pathways Temple Board of Directors. I am currently serving as Vice President. As a result of being the Vice President, I get to make announcements sometimes on this program that don't bring me much joy. Today is one of those days, but I am hopeful for the future, and I can't wait to see what happens after all of this is over. Over the past week, there's been much speculation and rumors as to what's been happening with the temple, and below is our explanation. As you recall, Stanley Nunn announced back in October of 2019 that he was going to leave the board and focus solely on his duties as guiding priest, effective December 1st. Due to other members leaving the board shortly after his resignation, Stan announced that he was returning to the board without consulting the board and would stay on until the board was once again stable and functioning. In many meetings since then, he has also reiterated his desire to leave the board and focus solely on his clergy duties. At the July 11th board meeting, the board asked Stanley Nunn to step down from his position on the board in order to concentrate more on his efforts as guiding priest. Over the past six months, Stan had some difficulties being able to complete all the duties associated with both positions, and we felt eliminating his responsibilities as board member would allow him to focus on what he does best. Unfortunately, Stan did not take this request well, and the, said the only way he was leaving the board was if he was officially voted off. So, a vote was called, and the only vote against his removal was that of, from his girlfriend, Dana Gorski. Following the vote, Stanley decided to sever all ties with the temple and chose to announce his decision via Facebook later that evening. Out of respect of our founder and former guiding priest, we decided to let him control the narrative, as we didn't want to put any statement out that could possibly harm his reputation or standing in this community. At the same meeting, we asked Dina Gorski to resign from her role as president and to return to the role of board member at large. She agreed. Later that week, some other issues and concerns were brought to the board's attention. We tried to address it with her, which resulted in her resigning from the board. On July 17th, Cynthia Day informed the board that due to her current health concerns, she needed to resign from her position as secretary and the duties it entails, but would continue to serve as on the board as a board member at large. Our current state. As a 501c3 nonprofit organization, by, the, by law, the board is required to have four officer positions, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Since two of those positions are now vacant, we will be having an election on all four positions at our meeting in August. While the title is required by the state and we recognize that each position is equal, with each having a single vote in all issues, and that no one person or position has the right of veto. As stated in the temple's bylaws, the board is ideally made up of nine individuals. Therefore, at this time, we have three open seats on the board. To fill those seats, we are asking anyone interested in becoming a member of the board to please send an email to the board at paganpathwaystemple at gmail.com. To be considered for the board, you must be a, a current member of the temple. A member is defined as having a purchased or lifetime membership, being a recurring paying member through PayPal, having a membership on Patreon, or having provided volunteer service that qualifies you for membership. In good standing with the pagan community. Have a history of service to the pagan community and a plan to continue that service. A willingness to take on new tasks to support the temple and the pagan community at large. The board will collect applications for the next month and will schedule will be scheduling interviews with the board in September. Looking to the future. We the board are committed to ensuring the continuation of Pagan Pathways Temple. We are determined to continue to provide a spiritual home where all paths are open. To that end, we pledge to be more transparent in our workings, to hold all members accountable for their actions and inactions, and to be more open to community input. As a part of our reorganization, we are looking for more involvement from the community and the clergy of various paths. We welcome all that would like to get involved in making the temple stronger and diverse. If you are a clergy member and would like to lead a service or host a series of classes on your path, 
please reach out to the board by using the email address paganpathwaystemple at gmail.com. You can also do so via the class submission form on our website, paganpathwaystemple.org. Thank you again, and have a wonderful rest of your week. And now that we've had our announcements, let's go ahead and get back to normal business. All of the opinions expressed on this show are those of the hosts or guests and do not necessarily express the views of Pagan Pathways Temple or its affiliates. Welcome to PPT Presents, Episode 28. Thank you for listening. Today on PPT Presents, we have Cynthia Day and Fur on It Makes You Think. Today they are taking the talking about the Tao Te Ching. After that, we have Conversation Corner with the Gladstones. Today they'll be talking about ancestors. Thank you so much for listening and sticking with us as we go through this turbulent time. And have a wonderful rest of your week. And now it's time for It Makes You Think by Cynthia Day. Subjects that are sufficiently complicated Enough to give one pause, just enough to make you think. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Cynthia Day, and welcome to It Makes You Think. Today, on our 28th podcast of It Makes You Think, I will be talking with Fur about the Tao Te Ching, something that Fur knows a lot more about than I do, and I think we stand to learn a lot this today. So, Fur, say hello. Uh, Hello. (laughs) Hello. You caught me off guard because you didn't say hi, Fur. Hi, Fur. Hi. (laughs) All right. Well, let's get started. The Tao Te Ching. Where did it originate? And what is it? Uh The Tao Te Ching is um, ancient writings from China. Uh, It started, they've got recordings of and starting back to 6th century BC. It's older than most of the parts of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, it was originally, it, a lot of it was just legend. They call it the Lasu mm-hmm. that wrote it. However, it's rather vague because of the fact that Lasu translates into old, old man, man, old white man. Old white yeah. man. Yeah, it was basically considered the sages that wrote it. Mm-hmm. However, the legend says that there was um, an older gentleman that went to, he got tired of all the feuding and all the fighting amongst the Chinese, and he just self-isolated in the mountains and he started writing and dictating to his um scribes yeah this writing and and they recorded it and but it was it's been passed down through many generations and everything there's probably been tons of adaptations and mm-hmm. it's been recorded the Dao de jing is basically re, um translated to the book of the way the way it's not a religious yeah it, it, it's not a, it's not way. a religious yeah. text it's a philosophical text no. it's a it's a way of being yes from what you told me and yes and it, it approaches life in a very it seems like passive but it's very accepting. It, mm-hmm. um, the Tao is considered not just a, a god-like creature, or it, it refers to the god as the source. The Tao is, and one of the first things it mentions is the Tao that can be named is no longer the Tao. Once you put a name on a, a god, or the source of creation. Everything, yeah. You lose, you lose the essence of it. So yeah, the, it's ineffable. Can, yes, it's infinite. Yeah, so it's it's and, kind of like the underlying um, energy of the universe that gives direction mm-hmm. to everything, 
but you can't really name it because if you name it, then you're you're quantifying it. But it's something that can't be quantified. It just is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And it's a very different way of approaching things than what you hear in, in most of Western society. Really? And, um, huh? Really? What? How? What's the difference? Because the way they it, it was written and approached is that Tao is within is not a separate essence from you or I or anything within this world um the Tao is within everything so it's within everything Anybody. that's been created and everything that hasn't been created yes okay so it's everywhere and, it's omnipresent yes okay and it, it's everything has an essence of the Tao, even and there's nothing that um takes precedence over another being Mm -hmm. um nobody's special nobody is a, a lot of christian values and a lot of christian beliefs have contradict this because they have this idea that um man was created in the um the image of god and god's yeah image but this has a totally different background than Christianity because we're all part of God. We're all part of the Tao. Right. And the Tao isn't necessarily a personality as in a God. It's something that's that's even more um, ineffable than that. It's, it's, it's the energy behind mm -hmm. everything. And you can't even call it the energy mm -hmm. because like I said earlier, if you put a name to it, then you're not really talking about the Tao. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, yeah, they really um, put a lot into the idea of releasing the ego. Mm -hmm. We we are we are raised from birth to think that we are separate from everything else. We have a you know this individual essence to ourselves, but the thing is, is that. Um, man is uh, uh, you were born to this world as a, you come into this body as a spirit mm -hmm. and eventually you will return to being a spirit you're just here for a few years and you will continue to move on with uh, one day you will return to to the spirit that you were yeah. Much, much in the same way as science says that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Your energy that is a spirit will always be. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that one of the things that is in line with the Tao? Yeah, that was one of the things. That, and um, yeah, letting go of believing that you are what you do, you are what... You're your job. What you have. Yeah. Yeah, and we are we are raised with this concept, especially in capitalism and the Western world. We are raised, you know, to seek out and we're motivated to get that job or have money or get the gold stars when you're a kid. You want the good grades. You yeah, because yeah. that's where your self yeah. and self. Um, worth comes from your self concept. The but whole you... the whole emphasis on the Western world is the individual, whereas in the yes. Eastern thought, it's not. It's what would you say? You're you're part of you're part of the whole being. Uh, like uh, we're little bits. Uh, you're like a hair on the head of the world. Mm -hmm. The land. Uh, he called it land of 10,000 things mm -hmm. and well nowadays you know that there's like billions of creatures out there but he was referring to you know you're the largest just number he could think of yeah. yeah and there's and the Tao takes no preferences over one thing or another 
you're just as important as your house plant. Wow. You, you are, yeah, it, everything that lives will die. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing you can do to control that or change it. And those who try to uh, change that are not living of the Tao. They're mm-hmm. not in connection with the Tao. And um, there was a lot of s- speech in there about um, we we become what we think about. Mm-hmm. You, every time you have, every time you have a thought about anything you put energy towards that so if you have troubles with if you put a lot of thoughts into worry or self-doubt you become it does draw energy from you it does draw make you weak Mm -hmm. if you work if you put energy into what you want to what you want to build towards you will make yourself stronger. If you think about it, if, if you put, um, if you think about what you want to become, you really are going to be selective about what you think about. Yeah, because um, yeah. even in the Wiccan um, um, train of thought, uh, what we put intent into is what we mm-hmm. manifest. And the Tao yes. is kind of saying the same thing. What we put energy behind, as they say in the Tao, is the direction mm-hmm. that we'll be going in, and it will it will manifest as ourselves mm-hmm. later on in life, mm-hmm. or maybe even sooner. And, yeah. Um, but it's interesting. They- it's it's interesting though uh, when you said that. Um, no one thing is more important than another. That really does sort of collapse the ego of the Western society because mm-hmm. we concentrate yeah. on the individual so much. And mm-hmm. so looking at the Tao where everything is equalized and equivalent, um, mm-hmm. the ego is, is sort of almost but shattered. I mean, it's there because we know that we are one person. But um, it's sort of an automatic balancer if you're thinking in terms of the Tao because you're no more important than anything else. Which I think is a really interesting concept. Everything plays its part. Mm -hmm. There is Tao in everything. Even people you don't like, even things that you think is bad. Like mosquitoes. But they serve a purpose. I still haven't figured out what mosquitoes' purposes is, but they must have a purpose. Uh, they do. <laughs> the uh, vectors. Uh, everything has its purpose, and mm-hmm. everything will take its course. Uh, everything that lives will die, mm-hmm. and uh, and since I've been trying to practice this, I I don't mourn death as much as I used to. Mm-hmm. You've come to a different terms with it. Yeah, I I will miss being around certain people when they pass away, but I I don't mourn for their loss. Mm -hmm. They they've done their time. (laughs) Basically, they've done their time in this body, and it's time for them to move on. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's and they're just as real in spirit as they were in body, because energy cannot be created or destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is a peaceful and accepting way of of dealing with death. And I can kind of get behind that with the Tao. I think that is a a very peaceful Mm -hmm. way of experiencing that kind of a change. Mm -hmm. Um, There was another concept that you were talking about, um, Wu Wei. Yes. And it's the concept of non-action and stillness. Those who are in connection with the Tao allow things to develop naturally. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because you you cannot force anything to happen. Um, No matter how much, and one of the biggest, uh, best examples is is love. Mm -hmm. You cannot force anybody to love you. No. You cannot force anyone to 
a relationship to blossom or something of that nature. You can't force hair to grow on your head. You, mm-hmm. you, it, it will either happen or won't. <laughs> and it, it's selfish and almost childish to think that we have that much control. Uh, uh, because humans, we want so much to adapt this world to our means, mm-hmm. and, and it's it's really um, it, it's really self self fulfilling and almost like um, yeah, it is rather childish to think that we know better than the Tao. Mm-hmm. It, God does every uh, you know the essence does everything perfectly it's just we gotta let it blossom and let it go and do its thing Mm -hmm. and we we have done so much to this world we we got growth hormones and our animals because we want them to you know produce faster we throw stuff on our crops to because we want to have it now Mm -hmm. we want uh, you know, we have gotten so selfish and self entitled that we want to manipulate this world to fit our needs, our wants. And that's ego. Uh, that's ego, yes. And those who want for nothing will have everything that they will want because once you let go of it, if you're grateful for everything that you receive, you will never want for nothing. You'll never want for anything, you mean? anything well yeah, yeah it was... <laughs> that's uh-huh. true and, and i've also heard it said that if you can't be happy with what you have you'll never be happy with what you get yes so the attitude of gratitude is um foundational in that yeah you you you, you need to appreciate what you have it's it's a it's a mindset mm-hmm. that you develop over time mm-hmm. to be appreciative and then when new things come along you can appreciate them as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there was a, um, you know, it, this is a very short book. It, it's yeah, a very it short. It's only about, it, let me see. 82 verses. 82 verses long. Yeah. Were there any yeah, that you but, wanted to read? Huh? Were there any verses that you wanted to read that you thought that someone might like to hear? Um, I don't have it sitting in front of me. You do. I do. But, I've, uh, I've got number 12, which I thought was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Let me read this. It's short, but let me read it. The five colors blind the eye. The five tones deafen the ear. The five flavors overwhelm the palate. Fancy things get in the way of one's growth. Racing here and there, hunting for this and that. Good ways to madden your mind, that's all. Relinquish what is without. Cultivate what is within. Live for your center, not your senses. Uh That says a lot to the American consumerism that is going (laughs) on. That says a lot to appreciating what you have. You know, instead of constantly looking for something new, something to uh, bowl yep. over your senses or something that's going to be just so fantastic, you know, if if you can cultivate, as it says, um, cultivate what is within and live mm-hmm. in your center, not your senses, then you will appreciate everything that comes along. Yes. I thought that was, when I found that, I thought that was very um, appropriate for a Westerner to Mm -hmm. kind of take hold of, especially when we're talking about being happy with what you have and having gratitude. Yes. There's so much in there that, and we have fallen away from, and we, we get so caught up in our senses, especially in modern society. We want the newest and latest thing. We want, you know, attention. We, you know, the ego. We feed the ego so much. Yeah. And, um, 
uh, like in verse 19, they're talking about eliminating hoarding and profiteering and thieves will disappear. Yeah. The less you have, the, the less you have to worry about. That's and, very true. You know, there's also another one, number 17, where it talks about leaders. I want to read mm -hmm. that one real quick. It says, the best leader is one whose existence is barely known. Next best is one who is loved and praised. Next is one who is feared. Worst of all is a leader who is despised. If you fail to trust people, they won't turn out to be trustworthy. Therefore, guide others by quietly relying on Tao. Then, when the work is done, the people can say, we did this ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important for leaders. I mean, granted, our nation can use more leadership than we have right now. But I also think it's important mm -hmm. in, that, in that reading that leaders that are less known, mm -hmm. um, they create a situation in which those who have been led rely on the Tao just as they do and then they can say when, when they complete something that we did this ourselves and it wasn't the leader mm -hmm. that did it at all. In other words, a leader leads his followers into being leaders and if mm -hmm. he doesn't, he's failed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, and it can be transferred more than just like leaders of country. It could be um, heads of corporations, it could be you know, if parents. Uh, it could be parents, um, it could be heads of churches, it could be heads of state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be teachers in a classroom, mm -hmm. because I've often heard that in a lot of instances, and this has been a lament of many of the teachers that I've talked to, that the curriculum that they are told to teach children, um, it's like garbage in, garbage out. But if you're a good mm -hmm. teacher, you teach a child how to learn, not how to memorize and regurgitate, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. Right, uh, so I think that also that, applies. Yeah, that that's really what's missing in a lot of curriculum, in a lot of teaching, because kids are just, re, are, are just taught how to memorize facts. Mm -hmm. They And they, they make no correlation between the facts in their heads. They're just regurgitating what they've read and what they've been mm -hmm. tested on. They're not being mm -hmm. tested on their ability to, oh, what would you call it? To synthesize new thought out of what they've got. Yeah, discover new things and mm -hmm. the curiosity. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why it's always like the best teachers are the ones that teach you how, you know, they help you learn how to look for the truth within yourself or you know within different ideas and stuff. and how to read between the lines as yes. well yes uh, uh, and once uh, verse 55 that i really think is going on right now what's that the things verse 55 okay let's talking about countries and um uh, cultures i guess things that are um, overdeveloped must decay and I really think that is what we're experiencing now it's like an overripened fruit would you like to read apart. that one as long as it's not too long it's not, I, it's I not too long it says okay. number 55 says she who is filled with goodness is like a newborn child wasps and snakes will not bite it fierce beasts will not attack it birds of prey will not pounce on it its bones are soft and its muscles weak, but its grip is firm. It hasn't yet known the union of male and female, yet its organ stirs with vitality. How can It can howl all day without becoming hoarse, so perfect is its harmony. To know harmony is to know the eternal. To know the eternal is to be illuminated. Prolonging life is not harmonious. Coercing the breath is unnatural. Things which are overdeveloped must decay. All this is contrary to Tao, and whatever is contrary to Tao soon ceases to be. Mm -hmm. I see what you mean about 
things being overdeveloped and must decay, much like Rome. And yeah. if America is Every, following in Rome's footsteps, much like America. Mm-hmm. It, every it, every society that gets overblown and over they overreach their bounds. They mm-hmm. they get too egotistical. Mm-hmm. They, they will fall apart. They will implode. The, Brit- the British Empire did that. Yeah. Um, Rome did. Mm-hmm. The Egyptian got over. Yeah, they got a big head about them. They got top heavy, and, yeah. Yeah, and they will fall apart because it it, it doesn't and it's nobody's gonna rule forever. It, it's our things will change. Um things have to change because if they don't change they yeah. become static and becoming static equals death. So if you want to live yeah. you have to contend with change. Mm-hmm. That's just something that I yeah. said. That's not actually in the Tao. Or if it is in the Tao, I just picked it up somewhere. Yeah. Um, was there and, anything? Um, was there anything else about the Tao that you wanted um, us Westerners to pick up on? Well, um, in verse twenty, they're talking about letting go of knowing and keeping open it for curiosity. And you will be at peace. Because those people who are most rigid, they are caught up in, um, they know what's going on. Mm. Well, I don't know anything about what's in this world. And if you let go of the idea that you know exactly how things should be, you will be more accepting of what's Oh, but what actually is actually happening? Yeah. Would you like me what to read is? that one? It's also short. Okay. Okay. It starts off as, "Be done with knowing, and your worries will disappear." How much difference is there mm-hmm. between yes and no? How much distinction between good and evil? Fearing what others fear, admiring what they admire—it's nonsense. Conventional people are jolly and reckless feasting on worldly things and carrying on as though every day were the beginning of spring. I alone remain uncommitted, like an infant who hasn't yet smiled, lost, quietly drifting, unattached to ideas and places and things. That's Mm -hmm. pretty powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is, and, and like I said before, you can, it's a short you know, book and and but you could spend you could spend an afternoon reading it in a lifetime trying mm-hmm. to figure it out. I found it's, that when I picked up the book and I started reading it, um, the the short the short sayings in them carried so much meaning that I had to put the book down and think about it for a while. I, you know, it, yeah, it, it it stirs up a lot of thought, which is the mm-hmm. way of the Tao, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anybody and, could and, use and, the Tao Te Ching as an adjunct to any religion or practice or philosophy that they have then, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Uh, there's there's many that have been in connection with the Tao, you could say. But it, it really, you can tell the people that are because the peace that they have. I I don't know how you how, um people who are, you who are not in conflict not. with the world. Um there was or there was some speech or some talk about, you know, um Gandhi mm-hmm. at Peace Bell. And um uh, it it just I, I don't, and it, it's very hard to describe, but those who, those who are in line with the Tao aren't just kind to people that are kind to them. They're kind to the unkind. They're kind to everyone. And kind, yes. And that is and without judgment. And that is really hard because we were raised 
to judge. And we are, well, in that Western society, yeah, we are. I, oh my God, I can't believe she acts that way. I, I, you know, what's going on with that person? You know, mm-hmm. and I can't believe that to their kid. And, you know, and um, we judge left actually, and right. We yeah. judge and we gossip and we ostracize and we yeah. put people on pedestals and we do all of this, which is so mm-hmm. unnecessary. Mm-hmm. I think I want to read the last one, uh, number 81 in the book. It says, true words aren't elaborate. Elaborate words aren't true. Good people don't argue. People who argue aren't good. People who know aren't mm-hmm. full of facts, and people who are full of facts don't know. The sage mm-hmm. doesn't hoard. She increases her treasure by working for her fellow human beings. She increases her abundance by giving herself to them. The way of heaven mm-hmm. benefit all, harm none. The way of the sage work for all, contend with none. Mm-hmm. And just like you said, yeah. Be kind to everyone, regardless, and making no judgments. That would be the way of the Tao? Yes. And it's, and you know, it's one of those things I've always, you know, I've aspired to since I've been introduced to it. Mm -hmm. Through I read one of Wayne Dyer's books and the way he approached the interpretations. It's beautiful. And it's, I, I don't, know as you know so much about Wayne Dyer but he was considered the motivational speaker yeah you know, one of the late day philosophers and um yeah the way he approached stuff and the way he taught uh it was really interesting and no it's it's really something to aspire to because you know I I might say that I like this and I believe in it, but it's it's really hard to live it. Yeah. Yeah, to undo your Western and, world conditioning and live the Tao is difficult. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And because we're taught to, you know, seek out that gold star to reach for the, you know, the, I, I want to get my book published and stuff, but it's, I'm trying to remind myself that even if I'm not published, I'm still a writer. That's true. I'm still a saint. I'm still a thinker. That's true. And those who don't seek for acknowledgement get the most acknowledgement. Lately, I've been getting more thrown in my laps than I ever thought. You know, even when I aspired for all this stuff, you know, I... Heck, being on your podcast, it just it just happened to me. I didn't seek out anything. You just hey, want to do this? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's and, because I knew that you were a very special and knowledgeable person, and you were um, humble about it. You have such humility about you, and I I wanted to bring that out for the world to see, because you are an intelligent, kind beautiful person mm-hmm. and um, I thought that you would make a very good cohort co-host for uh, it makes you think cohort, cohort yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're in cahoots yeah <laughs> but, uh, you look at things uh, everything will happen in its time it's course what's that again I, uh, you broke up a little bit <laughs> Um, everything will happen in its time, and we just have to learn how to slow down and not try to force everything. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the hardest things that I went through. And the thing is, is that we were programmed, and we got so much media and so much stuff trying to. Well, if you want this man, you got to go out and do this. You got to flirt with, and you got to, you know, rope somebody in and trick somebody to, and. Um, well, you want to be successful, you got to do this, that, and the other thing. and Step over you, people I, and climb the yeah. ladder. Yeah, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Knock people in the teeth in order to climb that corporate ladder. Yeah. But what is success? Is it material things? Is it 
or what you consider success to me not might not be the same thing. Mm-hmm. You want to have the most money in the world. You want to do this. You want to be popular. You want, I you know, the idea of being published to me would be nice, but it's not something that, you know, I I don't need to be on the top ten, you know, books or something. If I could just help a couple people learn about how to accept their child even with autism or something, then that would be something for me. Mm-hmm. Because because the way I wrote stuff and the way I put things in there is about accepting. It's not curing. Mm-hmm. It's accepting, it's fix, loving. Instead yeah, you don't need to, to fix it. somebody. Yeah. You don't have to always fix people. Sometimes you just have to love them. Yeah, and that's how I spent my marriage, my ex-husband, I wanted to fix him. He had all these problems and I I was going to fix him. I Who am I to try to fix anybody else? I'm messed up too. So I just, <laughs> I'm not perfect. Nobody is perfect. Mm-mm. And, I, and all, all you can do is all you can do. Yep. And that's what a lot of this is speaking about. Yep. So the Tao, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, um, translated by Brian Brown Walker, is the one that I have. And also people can look mm-hmm. up Wayne Dyer, is his name? Yes. And, and check him out on YouTube. He has a lot of things to say about the Tao. If you can't pick up the book, you can mm-hmm. certainly get on your computer and listen to him for a while speak on the Tao. Mm-hmm. So I want to thank you for for introducing um, the Tao to us today. And um, we'll see what our next program will be about. Um, It will be just as interesting, I'm sure, and it will make people think. (laughs) And I hope that today that uh, some things that, that we've read or gone over will make people think. And maybe pick up their version Mm -hmm. of the Tao Te Ching. So, Mm -hmm. um, we'll say goodbye for now. Say goodbye, Fur. Goodbye, (laughs) Fur. And um, we will talk to you all in the next two weeks with the next installation of It Makes You Think. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. We'll talk to you then. And now it's time for Conversation Corner with the Gladstones here on PPT Presents. Hi, this is Diana Gladstone. Hi, this is Nancy. And this is our Conversation Corner. And today we want to talk to you about ancestors. What are they? Who are they? What do they do? And all that other fun stuff. Should be a fun conversation today. Yeah, especially since I'm talking to a shaman who always seems to have ancestors hanging around. Yes. So, What are ancestors to you? Well, of course, there is the literal term, meaning those people who are farther, yeah, those people farther up your bloodline. So ancestors are like my mom, my dad, my grandparents, my great grandparents, and so on and so forth. Back to the beginning of time. Who are they to you? Um, To me, they are guides. They guide me along my path of life. And they are also my guardian angels. They keep me safe. And they protect me. And for me, they're always around. I always feel them. I always see them. But for a lot of people, they are just loved ones. And some loved ones, it just crossed over. So when you want to connect to an ancestor, or when you think of an ancestor, do they have to be blood-related? Not always. Like some of your family, who you call family, who are near and dear to you, aren't blood related, but they're still family. And so they still, to me, become part of your ancestral line. That makes sense, because there are people I have seen as my ancestors in the afterlife, or in the underworld, that 
technically have no blood tie to me, even though she still likes to come around and yell at me in Polish. <laughs> so what do you typically call your ancestors that are around you? Um, they're typically my guides. Okay. The ones that are that are around me pretty much 24-7. Um, so what I was trying to get Nancy to say there is she typically calls them her menagerie. Well, yeah, because I have nine of them. <laughs> Most people don't have nine. True. Um, so of the nine, who are they? Two are prominent. One is my sister and the other one's my dad. Well, three. And my great-grandfather. Or my grandfather, not my great My grandfather, my sister, and my dad. Okay. Those are the three that hang around the most. My dad comes and goes, but my sister and my grandfather are there 24-7. Even so much so, Diana can hear my sister. <laughs> She's gotten very loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but then the other three... Are they all human? Um, I have nine, remember? Okay, other six, sorry. Um, math, math is not my forte today. Three are Indians. I don't know what kind, but I know three are Indians. And the other three I don't think are even human from this planet. Okay, so they could be... Spirits or aliens or, or who knows something what. else. I know. I know they talk to me in bells and whistles. Okay, that's what it sounds like. It is not English, and my conscious doesn't understand. And when I don't understand, all they do is get louder, which you've heard too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. They act as your guides, so for you as a shaman, you can hear them often, right? Yes, I hear them even when I don't want to hear them. <laughs> and then I ignore them, and they just get louder, and then they just, when I really, really ignore them, and they go to you and say, hey, make her listen. <laughs> yes, I am the equivalent of Nancy's spiritual answering machine. <laughs> when they can't reach Nancy, they leave a message with me and bug me so I make Nancy listen. Yep, that's how it works. <laughs> I can't get away from them. <laughs> so, for those people who are not shaman, how do they typically connect to their ancestors? That's a good question for you to answer. How do you typically connect to your ancestors before you met me? Okay, so before I met Nancy, I did not have a strong connection to the spiritual world. In fact, I would typically only be able to connect to my ancestors on Samhain. And so the first year Nancy and I were together, um, Samhain came, we handed out all the candy for the trick-or-treaters, and I'm like, okay, I, I need to go take my ritual bath, I need to set up my stuff so that I can talk to my grandfather, I can talk to my, to my deceased grandfather who I love and care for. And she gives me the strangest look on the planet like I'm an idiot and have no idea what I'm talking about. But so I go, I set up my bath, I set up my crystals, I set up my candles. Well, I've never seen it before. Yeah. And so I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to get into the trance so I can talk to my grandfather. And I start hearing these voices that I don't recognize. And I hear this, this little voice giggling, going, Oh, isn't that cute? Look what she's doing. Isn't that cute? And then I hear this other older voice go, Ah, oh, hush now. She's doing her thing. Let her be. And I'm like going, These are not voices of any of my ancestors that I know of. And I start chanting and calling my grandfather's name. And I hear a voice pop up, one of these females again, going, Oh, you want your ancestors? Here, hold on a minute. And then all of a sudden, I hear this whoosh, and literally, my grandfather, my grandmother, my Polish nana, my great-grandfather, who is a Southern Baptist minister, are all in the room with me. And none of them are happy about how they got there. And... 
And so, and so this voice goes, okay, I brought him. Do you want more? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and apparently that was Nancy's sister, Lori, being helpful. And so I start trying to talk to them. I'm like, I, I, I want to thank you for coming. I, I'm honored by your presence. I love you guys. You know, I hope you're proud of how, what I've become and how I've become. Because most of these people have been dead 20, 30 years. Well, apparently that was the wrong thing to say to my Polish Nana, who is very Catholic. Because she starts berating me for um, A, being pagan, B, being gay, and C, just the way I'm living my life, apparently. And so she starts yelling at me. And she gets so mad that she starts yelling at me in Polish. Which apparently is close enough to Yiddish because Nancy's Aunt Marcia starts yelling back at my Nana in Yiddish. So imagine, I'm believing I'm having a psychotic break because there are two old women yelling in a different language in my head. <laughs> but thankfully, <laughs> Lori was able to usher them away and eventually <laughs> calm down enough so I could start talking to my grandfather, which was what I had only wanted to do in the first place. Um, but after that time... Um, Nancy's like, you know, you know, you can talk to your grandfather whenever you want. You don't have to wait just for the when the veil's thin. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so about a month later, she's teaching me how to meditate so that I can get in contact. And again, her sister, Lloyd, to be helpful, went, hold on, I'll get him. So went again to wherever my grandfather happened to have been and drug his hiney to me. So now, mind you, my grandfather is this sweet old Irishman. And he gets there and he's like, that woman drug me again. Quit sending that woman after me. <laughs> so now, typically, well, um, what I have been able to do is grandfather just said, okay, when you really need me, just send up a call. Don't send that woman and I'll come talk. But he acts like we have some say in the matter of Lori tracking him down. She does what she wants. <laughs> but so um be careful when you find a guiding spirit who wants to help make sure they understand helping find your ancestors doesn't mean dragging them wherever the hell they are to where you are because <laughs> sometimes it gets the ancestors upset yes but Lori doesn't care yes <laughs> Lori still thinks it's funny yes every time he says the words that woman she starts snickering <laughs> i think she likes the title yes i think so too but so if you don't happen to have a friendly ancestor or spirit guide on the other side willing to play Roundup, um, I would say the best way of getting in contact with your ancestors are really, it's through meditation. Meditation. And trancing. If you can find a shaman who can help you travel the world tree down into the underworld, um, it's easiest to find them then. Yes, it is. But you need to know someone or you need to know yourself how to get to the world tree and how to anchor yourself and how to get to Lodge and then how to go down to the other world. Yes, because um, I will say I've, I've seen Nancy um, have to play, I jokingly call it um, soul goalie um, when people for the first time get to the underworld because they like to wander off and try to get lost and so nancy's always kicking them back into play yep and keeping them near enough to their anchor so they don't actually get stuck there including you okay i don't journey well and we know this yes i know but when you get down there you like to go wander and explore away from everybody else okay so i'm a rebel without a cause what can i say <laughs> um so i know several people who have an ancestor altar yes i'm one of them i actually have um, pictures of my grandparents and special symbols for them. Um, I know that in a lot of faiths, they talk about offering, um, oh, what is it? Ritual? What? Stuff. What do they call the stuff they give the ancestors? Offerings. Offerings. Okay, so brain dead today. I can't think of words. Um, and so a lot of people talk about when they're offering, giving offerings to the ancestors, they'll give them alcohol, they'll give them tobacco, things like that. Um, give them crystals and stones, too. Crystals, stones. So, um, 
Do you have to give offerings to your ancestors? No, I don't. Actually, my ancestor altar is incorporated with my other altar. I have, like, the seal was my sister's, and that's mm-hmm. on her altar. Yep. And for me, I, my offerings to my ancestors are usually, like, my grandfather on his birthday, I light a candle, and I wish yeah. him a happy birthday. Um, Nancy being a pagan witch, or pagan Jewish, Jewish witch, witch, um... I they light, light candles, your sight candles, your sight candles on um, the anniversary of their death. Yes, versus their birth. Um, me personally, I've never offered my grandfather tobacco because he tried so he worked so hard to quit smoking. I wouldn't dare insult him by giving him tobacco. Um, and he's an Irishman; he don't need no more booze. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I would say, if you want to make an offering to your ancestors. Think about things they would like. Um, For my grandmother, who loved lilacs, um, when they're in bloom, I will always bring a sprig in and place it before her picture on my altar to honor her. Um, When they're not in bloom, I have a lilac-scented candle that sits over by her. Yes, but it doesn't have to be a picture. It can be an item that Mm -hmm. they cherished. Yep. Um, So... You said your ancestors act as guides. How are do how do they do that? Besides being um, nagging and laughing in my ear, um, they have kept me alive in a really really bad car accident where I should have been killed four times over in one car accident. They have stopped my windshield wipers in a downpour once. Where I would have been T-boned by a semi-truck if I didn't have to pull off the side of the road. Because I had no winter wipers in a thunderstorm. Things like that have happened through me throughout my life that I should still not be alive. That my ancestors have helped me or prevented me from being killed. Okay. Me? I t- And just... Being alive today because of how premature I was. And for me, I typically would go talk to my grandfather when I needed wisdom outside myself. Meaning um, my emotions were too tied into the situation and I needed a more objective view. Um, Because in my opinion, with the ancestors being passed over... They're no longer as limited by physical concerns as we are here in this plane. So they can see a bit beyond us. And you need that because you're an emotional person where I am a walnut shell and I don't show emotions and hide them and bury them and very few people see them. So I don't go through life with emotions and I don't need that emotional Whereas I need my grandfather to tell me, okay, yes, you're being totally irrational. Here's the logical answer, <laughs> not the emotional one. Um, so, well, with yours being all the way, all the ways around you, um, I you have know. a different sense of when they pass. Mm-hmm. I rarely cry at funerals. I rarely get upset. At funerals, I only cry when it's a chain reaction cry. When someone else cries, it makes me want to cry too. But I am not crying for me. I am crying because of the chain reaction. Because I don't miss them because they don't leave me. They're still... If I have a really strong bond and connection, they're still always around me until they permanently cross over and only a shell is left there. Mm-hmm. Their echo. Their echo. Whereas I will cry at people's funerals that I don't know. But then again, I also cry at Hallmark movies, Hallmark TV commercials, and puppy commercials. Yes. Um, ASPCA commercials get me every time. <laughs> I hate Sarah McLaughlin now. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, your grandfather used to say. My grandfather used to call me his waterworks. He used to be, so he was a farmer, and so he would say, if there was ever a drought, 
he was going to put me in the middle of his field and show me a puppy and the field would be watered. (laughs) He was a lovely man. (laughs) with a (laughs) wicked sense of humor. Um, But, you know, sometimes communicating with your ancestors can make you miss them more in your present life. But it can also help bring you a sense of peace. Um, just knowing that they're still there, knowing that they still see you. I think the hardest day for me was the day I learned my grandfather had chosen to be reborn so Mm -hmm. that I was not going to be able to connect with him as he was as Harley Tapman on the other side anymore. That all I would get would be his, his echo or his shout. Now, and this, these are my beliefs, so if you believe something different, totally fine. Um, what I believe, what remains in the afterlife is when, or when a person dies, their self and their soul goes to the afterlife. They stay there for a while to rest, to recuperate, to still connect with others, to absorb the lessons and ideas that they learned in that lifetime. And then they choose to come back to this world and be reborn. But what remains in the underworld is an echo of how and who they were in that life. That's why you can find ancestors all the way along, back along, even though they've probably already been reborn, because that echo of who they were at that life stays. Yes, I agree with that, too. And so one of the hardest days for me was when my grandfather um, shared that he was... Last Alan. Last Alan, that he was going to be reborn. And so... Well, you didn't even get it. I had to explain to you what was... No, I know. And boy, did I cry. Um, But so now when I think of my grandfather or I see him in the underworld, um, I get... I only get to talk to his echo, which is um, when I was talking to my real grandfather, um, he had new ideas, new information. He said new things in new ways where his, his echo is only able to repeat things that he had experienced before. So it's, for me, it's like the difference between having a conversation with a person and having a conversation with a computer program that can only respond as it was previously recorded. Yep. That's the best way I can explain it. So I still get to, I still, when I need it, I can still go down to the underworld and hear my grandfather tell me he loved me. Because that's something he said a lot. You can still get gibbs uh, I can still get hit on the back of the head for doing stupid things because that's something he did a lot as well. Yep. Um, <laughs> but it's hard to have a new discussion with him because he's, his, his essence, his soul is no longer there to offer new opinions for me. Yeah. But, all right, so hopefully you guys got something out of this rambling talk about ancestors. Um, If nothing else, I hope some of our stories made you laugh and gave you ideas on how you can connect with yours. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us at paganpathwaystemple at gmail.com. Um, And just reference the Gladstones. We'll be sure to get it. Or hit us up on Facebook. All right. All right. Blessed be, guys. Blessed be.